This is a hot topic. It can be. I have to admit, I don't know how I feel about talking about this on national television. I was in the education system uh, as an educator for 29 years. So can you kind of give us a bit of a crash course on what's being taught with the current sex ed? It's a rights-based approach. Things like internet sex and texting actually become preferred rather than told don't do this because you don't exchange body fluids. Most parents are very alarmed. They're teaching anal and oral sex in grade six. They're not teaching the, the skill. Okay. But what they're saying is basically, well, these are ways in which you could express yourself. We've come up with a, a process to help parents to positively engage with the system. The parents and the faith community are not engaged on the topic. Then the only authority on the subject engaging with the child is the school. What's the number one factor that encouraged you to first engage in sex. 40% said my sex ed curriculum. Oh, wow. Welcome back to the show. The topic of today's program is one that hits a nerve in many Canadians, but for various reasons. It's the topic of sex education in our public schools. And I want to say up front that viewer discretion is advised today. We will be discussing some mature and somewhat awkward content. To give context to the conversation surrounding sex education in public schools, it came to a head a few years back in 2015 when the Ontario government introduced their controversial new sex ed curriculum covering topics that many parents felt were age inappropriate or completely inappropriate for a public school setting. Since then, conversation has continued to come to a head in various provinces across the nation, most recently in Alberta with the passing of Bill 24, which makes it illegal for a teacher to tell a parent if their child joins a gay-straight alliance club, and also in BC with the push to implement SOGI curriculum. In Ontario, the 2015 changes revamped the curriculum at that time to include the following. Showing and labeling male and female genitalia in grade one, introducing concepts of gender identity in grade three, teaching sexual self-discovery through masturbation in grade six, and introducing the practices of anal and oral sex in grade seven. Wow, I never thought I would say those words on national television, so here we go. The reality is that as awkward as it is, we need to talk about this topic because it affects millions of Canadian children and families. Those who are in favor of the changes to the various sex ed curriculum say that children need to be informed on these issues so that the transmission of STDs can be reduced, children can be taught principles of mutual consent and encouraged to explore alternative forms of sexuality the assumption is that kids are not going to have these conversations at home, and if they do, parents might get it wrong. Those who are not in favor of the curriculum say that public school is a place for kids to learn math, science, reading, and writing, not masturbation, anal sex, or oral sex. Some have expressed that they feel the sex curriculum is motivated by a radical leftist agenda, attempting to shift the mindset of the next generation and how they view sexuality. And some feel it's simply a response to the culture. Others feel it's trying to drive a social agenda and a whole boatload of people simply don't know what to do with it all. So that's why we are going to talk about it today. My guest today, Phil Lees, not only was an educator for 29 years himself, but is also the current director of Peace Ontario, which has been tackling this tough issue head on for parents. Peace Ontario works to educate parents on what is being taught to their children, mentor them in how to build positive relationships with schools, and train parents on how to be effective first educators to their children. Phil is one of the nation's leading voices on this issue, and it is an honor to have him with us in studio today. This is a loaded topic, so strap on your seatbelts. Let's get to it. Hey, Phil. Hey. Good to see you. Thank you. I'm so Great glad to be you're here, here on you. the show today. What a sizzler. This is a hot topic. It can be. I have to admit, I don't know how I feel about talking about this on national television, but I'm glad that you're an expert on this topic of sex oh. curriculum. 
And uh, you. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of amazing stuff to say today. But uh, first off, I want to say this. So you were a teacher for 29 years, is that correct? I was in the education system uh, as an educator for 29 years, yes. Okay, wow. And it, you served as a teacher and then you were also an administrator for part of that time. Uh, I was an educator, a consultant, and I did spend a couple of years at the Ministry of Education working okay. on policy, things like that, yeah. Okay, and you're also a parent. Yes, absolutely. You know, you're Three you're wonderful <laughs> adult children now and a grandparent of uh, four and one on the way. Wow. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And so you bring a unique perspective to this conversation from a lot of tears yeah. and uh, looking forward to hearing all about that. But I want to just start off because a lot of parents are honestly just kind of alarmed, you know, that, that things are being revamped in the way that they are. They don't really know what to think. And a lot of parents are asking the question of like, what exactly is being taught. So can you kind of give us a bit of a crash course on what's being taught with the current sex ed curriculum? Well, I think in your introduction, mm -hmm. you provided a, a, a pretty, I, I would say, clear overview. Okay. Right? Um, I think what's important is to understand what's driving it. Mm, okay. All right? And it's a philosophy called sexual risk reduction. Okay. All right. And sexual risk reduction, basically the definition, or sometimes we call it comprehensive sex education, is it's a rights-based approach to equip young children mm -hmm. with the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, and the values so that they can determine their sexuality, mm. meaning mm. their gender, their sexual orientations, etc. okay? Determine their sexuality and enjoy their sexuality individually and in relationships. So when you talked about, for example, masturbation, all right, masturbation is an important skill within sexual risk reduction so that children can investigate what, how they like to express themselves sexually, right? Find out if, and then they can communicate because in grade seven, one of the important skills is that children need to be able to communicate what they prefer sexually and what they agree with, but they need to investigate that through self-investigation. Now, this isn't what you're saying. This is what SRR says, sexual risk reduction ideology. And it's in our health curriculum. Okay. Okay, you know, I hear this, Phil, honestly, and I think, man, in grade six and seven, what was I doing? Honestly, I was collecting stickers. I was jumping skip rope. I was doing, like, we had scratch and sniff stickers back in the day. I was not thinking about these things, and it, to me, just seems pretty aggressive. Uh, you know, and maybe I'm off base on this, but to be bringing this right into the classroom setting that young, and I, I think a lot of parents feel the same way. Um, what kind of feedback are you getting from parents across the nation when you, when you have these discussions? Well, most parents are very alarmed, mm. and they're asking questions, what can we do? Mm. How can we engage with the system? How do we, how do we, positively influence and we get people reacting in different ways and you've seen that mm -hmm. you know we've seen the protests around our legislatures mm -hmm. right and uh, but we what we found is is that actually seems to often worsen the situation for us mm -hmm. it it uh, makes the system uh, it convinces the system that the way they're going is right mm -hmm. all right and so we've come up with a, a process uh, to help parents to positively engage with the system, mm -hmm. right? build relationship, mm -hmm. share what their needs are because the system says that we need to accept and respect everyone. Mm -hmm. So we need to communicate what our needs are. Right. And then share how uh, learning can be differentiated for our children to make learning more effective. Okay, okay. We're, I want to go deeper into that in a moment. But first of all, you mentioned something about parents being first educators. And I know that there was a, a study, there's actually been several studies that have been done that actually prove that parents are actually the most influential figures in a child's life if they engage with their child. And then you said number two was actually their faith community. And number three was sort of their peer group or their, their schools. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. The, the research shows that if parents and the faith community that the child is part of, if they will engage on the subject of sexuality with mm -hmm. the child, provide instruction and guidance and engage in a lifelong discussion, right, and guidance with the children, that they are the first and second most influential agents of influence in the child's life. Right. Third is the school. 
Mm -hmm. But if the school and, or sorry, if the parents and the faith community are not engaged in the topic, then the only authority on the subject engaging with the child is the school. Yeah, number three becomes number one. That's in right. In that case. And in our school system, for example, the goal is to help children understand if they choose to express themselves sexually, how to do it in ways that may be less risky. So then things like internet sex and texting actually become preferred rather than told don't do this because you don't exchange body fluids. Okay. And so part of what you do with Peace Ontario is you actually train parents on how to be first educators and how to have the tough conversations with their kids. Right. And we're going to cut to a clip here in a second, but before we do, uh, you shared with me a, a few statistics that you equip parents with mm -hmm. to help them have conversations. Why don't you just share a few of those stats with us right now? Sure. Well, the reality is, is that, you know, <laughs> and, and is that 50% and more, depending on the age group, engage in sexual activity, all right? Uh, 50 of teens engage in sex. Second, of those children, right, when it comes to are we reducing sexually transmitted infections, 54% of all sexually transmitted infection diagnoses are within the 15 to 24 age group. And they're only 12.3% of the population, so it's a huge uh, misrepresentation. And it indicates that there is increased sexual activity happening in that age group more so than overall. Wow. Right? So evidence would show then, or seem to indicate that the curriculum is actually causing kids to become more sexually active. As a matter of fact, Barna did a study and they surveyed sexually active teens and asked the question, what's the number one factor that encouraged you to first engage in sex? And 40% of teens, out of all of the things they could choose, 40% said, my sex ed curriculum. Oh, wow. Wow, so this is something parents need to be talking to their kids about. So we're gonna cut to a clip here right now, and then we'll be right back with Phil. Right now, I have with me someone who is amazing. He is a parent. Uh, when he first began to engage uh, the, with this conversation, his kids were only four and six. That was about eight or nine years ago now, right eight, Steve? About eight years ago. Yeah, I have Dr. Steve Tur Lucas. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about your story. What exactly happened? Well, in about 2010, I discovered that uh, there were changes coming to the curriculum, and some of these changes concerned me. I approached my school, uh, and I asked them if they would um, give me advance notice when they were going to teach uh, materials to my children that would conflict with my Christian faith. I was very clear to them. I said, I didn't mind factual information. It's when they started saying that uh, certain behaviors were okay. It was their value judgments that I, I was concerned about. So you weren't like slamming the ideology or saying that other people couldn't be taught this. You're just saying, hey, I, I want autonomy over my own children. Can I have it, please? Exactly. They said basically, no, we, when we want to teach some of these topics, we can't let your kids out of the class because that would hurt, uh, that could potentially hurt the feelings of somebody else in the class. Every school board in Ontario has a history of of accommodating religious beliefs that many people would find much more offensive than my personal religious beliefs. There's the school in Toronto where they have a Friday prayers. Women are supposed to be sitting behind the men in the gymnasium, in the cafeteria actually, and menstruating girls are supposed to sit at the very back of the, of the uh, cafeteria. So they accommodate beliefs like that in schools, mm -hmm. but they it won't accommodate me. So it felt like a bit of a double standard. Well, it's completely inconsistent. It's hypocritical. It's all of that. But uh, what can I do? Well, you can share your story. So you took the school to court, and there were actually three things that, that you were going for in that initial court case, right? So I wanted the school board to tell me in advance when they were going to expose my children to certain materials. I wanted the right to have my children removed from the class uh, at my discretion if they were going to be teaching anything which conflicted with my Christian faith. And I wanted a declaration from the court that I was the final authority in the, in the education of my children. Okay, so what happened? I went to court and I lost, unfortunately. The judge was very clear that they were violating my constitutional rights. So the judge acknowledged that I had the, the constitutional rights to, with, to protect my children from what I, I consider false teachings. But the judge said that it was reasonable for them to violate my constitutional rights because they were doing so in the name of equity and inclusiveness. It's necessary for us to violate your constitutional rights just to make a, a safe, welcoming and equitable 
learning environment for other, chil for other children as if my children didn't matter. You know, I, I am consoled somewhat by the fact that it was a good loss in a way because uh, two of the three judges were quite favorable to my position and they basically laid the framework for the next parent who wants to fight against this. Maybe the next parent will be successful. This isn't so much only about ideology, this is also about autonomy, right? Yes, absolutely. A and really answering the question, who is the final authority over the children? Is it the state, is it the school, or is it the parent? And uh, would you say that that's kind of what it boils down to? It's, it's also the religious freedom uh, portion of it, but it's absolutely right that you're correct. It was very difficult for me to be told that I don't have the right to know what my kids are learning in school. So where do you think we stand right now as a nation on the issue of parental autonomy? We're not in a good place. We're not in a good place. So what would your message to Canadian parents be at this point? They have to take an extremely active role in their parents, in their children's education. They have to engage with teachers as much as possible. Uh, ask questions, be as involved as possible in your kids' education. As Christian parents, we have to start having conversations about human sexuality at an earlier age, perhaps sooner than we would feel comfortable, because if we don't give our biblical perspective on issues relating to human sexuality, there is a union activist or community organizer who is more than happy to come to the school to give you their worldly opinion on these matters. Okay, well, Phil, let's continue to talk about this topic of parents as first educators. So you have a, a couple programs that you yes. offer through Peace Ontario. One is called Building Family Connections, yes. and that's actually a curriculum for parents, correct? That's right. It's a it's a ten hour, basically ten hour module. Okay. Okay, for parents, uh, and basically, what are the what are the factors that affect relationship with your child, mm. and how to Im improve that, mm -hmm. so that you can get to the point where you can start talking about Powerful. sexuality, sexually transmitted infections, and things and, and things like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've been uh, and it was developed not by us, but by the Medical Institute for Sexual Health. Okay with funding from the Center for Disease Control because it is so effective. Wow. All right, and it's so effective well, that's good. that some, some states in the United States are requiring their social workers to actually get certified and trained in this. Wow. So it's been so effective. Yes. So it's vetted, proven? Absolutely. Yes. And so you're, how can parents get access to this? They can either go to your website or, as I understand it, you can also take this to churches, right? Absolutely. That's, okay. And actually, that's for us, we want to reach out to faith parents. Okay. All right. And so, you know, this can be offered in the church. The information is on our website. There's a, there's a description and an overview. Now, what is your website? Okay. Peaceontario.com. Peaceontario.com. There we right. go. So they can get the info, they can get an overview and then they can contact us and schedule uh, a presentation that fits their timelines. Mm -hmm. So you'll come right into the church. Yes. You'll do a seminar to equip parents on how to have meaningful conversations with their kids on, on these topics. Now, exactly. one of the statistics that really rocked me that you sent my way was the one about actually throat cancer. And, yeah. and, and this is again an awkward one, but they're teaching anal and oral sex in grade six, mm -hmm. right? Did I get that right? You have to be careful with the term. They'll be offended when they say we're teaching oral sex or introducing they're, they're not teaching the they're not teaching the the skill okay but what they're saying is basically well these are ways in which you could express yourself that might be safer you won't get pregnant uh -huh. okay but what they don't do is share the statistics okay for example when it comes to oral sex when it and when it, uh, oral sex leads to transfer of HPV in okay. the throat. Okay. Okay, and uh, there are a couple of strains of HPV that actually lead to throat cancer. Okay, right? and you shared a statistic that th there was a study done that said that throat cancer is 500% higher in those individuals that engage in oral sex on a regular basis, is that? That's right, if you've had five <laughs> partners, five oral sex partners or more, okay, you have a five-fold increase in the chance of gaining, uh, of, of uh, contracting uh, oral cancer. 
Okay, but I'm going to say that type of thing is important information because I, mm -hmm. I rewind my tape, you know what I mean? And I think back to when I was 13, 14 mm -hmm. years old, you know, uh, you know, my, my head was screwed on pretty straight. And I know as, as a junior higher, you know, if my parents would have shared that kind of information with me, you know what? I would not have touched that activity with a 10-foot pole if I was mm -hmm. informed. And I think young kids, I think they're smart. And if we can uh, give them this kind of information, I think they'll make really great choices that will help protect them. What are some of the other tidbits that you that you give parents to equip them to talk to their kids? Well, when it comes to, for example, other sexually transmitted infections, uh, when it comes to anal sex, men who have sex with men, for example, uh, you know, there is a 4,000 to 7,000 percent greater risk of becoming HIV positive than when you compare that group with active heterosexual males. Okay. So, so all of those kinds of inf information, I think, assist parents to help children to establish boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that the school system has difficulty with, and it's not a criticism, because they need to be accepting of everyone. So it's difficult to share this information, because if we share that information, are we going to be offending that group for mm. whom that's their preferred method of sexual expression? Right. So it really behooves yeah. us to, in, to train parents to be able to empower their children. Yeah, and, and you have to ask the question, what's more important, potentially offending somebody who's, who's going a certain direction or protecting that's right. Individuals from yeah. from possible consequences, and um, so equipping parents, amazing. You've got this uh, building family connections. You've also got Heritage Keeper, yes. with, which is a curriculum that that parents can actually introduce to That's teachers, right? right? Yeah, actually, Heritage Keepers it's for kids is a program for students aged our uh, grade six to twelve. All right, and you know we said problem is the church isn't engaging on this subject. This is a program that can come into the church. Mm -hmm. It's a classroom-based curriculum. Okay. Okay. It has been developed and it has been tested and proven that when it is implemented in a public school classroom, it reduces teen sexual activity by 70%. And it doesn't do it by just saying, don't you engage in sex, be <laughs> abstinent. It doesn't do that. What it does is it teaches life skills. What are your goals? Mm -hmm. What are your objectives? Wow. What do you want to achieve? That's amazing. What are some of the things that could interfere with that? Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at some statistics. If you're a girl and you happen to get pregnant, 67% of girls who become pregnant end up living in poverty the rest of their lives. Mm. Wow. Okay. And so what are some of the, what are your goals and objectives and what are the skills we can provide you with wow. to protect those goals and skills so that you can achieve those. Wow, and what I love about your curriculum, Phil, is that it is statistically based, the information has been vetted. You're not ramming religion down anybody's throat. You're, you're really just looking at this pragmatically and from a medical perspective. It's really, really interesting. Now, um, again, the website, PeaceOntario.com. Because I know there's more to, to, to talk about that Much we're going to be able to fit on this time. So you also encourage parents to get involved, build relationships with their teachers. Give a quick tip on how sure. to do that. Okay. Our time's closing in here. We, all right. We have, we have a program. We have a five-step process. You can access it on the website. We can come to your church. But number one, engage the facts. Understand what your children are really being exposed to. Mm -hmm. Let's not get emotional about it. Okay. Number two, start building relationship with your ch uh, child's teacher. You know, the most effective thing, <laughs> I remember the parent uh, in my class, I was helping out the child uh, when they happened to be away, and the parent would come in every once in a while with a Tim Hortons double-double. Oh, wow. Just a small <laughs> way to bless. I remember those people, right? Wow. So build those relationships so that when it's time to discuss you have relationships. You have relationships. Amazing, That's right. That's Phil. Right. You're doing such a fantastic job. This is such an edgy and fascinating topic. Thank you for what you do, Phil, and thank you for being with us today. Find out more about it online, and let's keep having this conversation on social media. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Faith Team. It's an honor to be here. If you aren't teaching your kids about sex, who is? For 20 years, Peace has been empowering families to positively disciple and mentor their children on difficult cultural issues in education such as sexuality. In our five-step process, first parents engage the facts. They first learn to understand what is being taught in school and why. Next, the peaceful process. How to build positive relationship with their child's teacher so that when it comes time to discuss sensitive issues, 
they're openly accepted. Third, how to engage your child on the issue of human sexuality. And we have resources to help parents to become the trusted adult and the trusted source of information. And lastly, how to engage your school. And we have resources to help parents to communicate with the school, to build understanding of the faith needs of the family so that learning for the child is more effective. The first step of the peace process is to engage the facts. And I love the resources that Phil's created where you can literally look at your child's grade and say, okay, in this grade, the fact is my child is gonna learn this in this specific lesson at this point of the year. And there is scientific research that shows the first thing that a child learns becomes their filter in that situation. So if I teach them first, then they're gonna filter all other information God cares about our schools. He cares about our teachers and they love our children. And we have to treat them as people who love our children and want to partner with us to create a positive future for the next generation. When it comes to the decisions that a child makes about sexuality, the research shows that children make decisions based upon a consistent message coming to them from parents, the church, and ideally the school. Peace has resources to help the church and to help parents to provide a consistent, biblically aligned message. Thank you so much for joining us for today's show. This program is brought to you by generous Canadians just like you who care, who care about the issues and the conversations that are shaping our nation's future. And so I wanna invite you to help us continue to bring these shows to you on a regular basis and cover even more critical conversations for our nation. You can be a part of making this happen by signing up to partner with us on a monthly basis. It's actually our monthly partners that help keep us at it. You can sign up to partner by going to our website, fayteen.com. You can also go there to make a special one-time donation if you like, and that would also be a tremendous help. If you enjoyed today, please stop by our online channel under Fateen Show on YouTube. Subscribe to receive notifications for future episodes and share the links with your family and friends to help us spread these messages. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we'd love to meet you there and keep the conversation going. You might even catch a few cute pictures of my kiddos and see life behind the scenes. Thank you so much for your interest and for your consideration in helping us keep these messages and this movement strong. When you partner with us, not only are you partnering with a television show that is talking to Canadians about important issues from a unique perspective, but you are also partnering with national prayer initiatives, equipping events, assistance and outreaches to the poor, rescuing women from the sex trade, and child sponsorship in several third world nations. Thank you so much for your support. It really makes a difference.